Good day and welcome. I am Les Roy Williams. Today I am here to do an interview with the Sankey's Department of Culture. And today we will be talking about culture, of course, but we will be highlighting intangible culture. And we will hear more about that as the interview goes on. But first, let me introduce you to my esteemed guests. They are Miss Marlene Phillips, well known, and she is research and documentation specialist at the St. Kitts Department of Culture. She is also the St. Kitts and Nevis Intangible Cultural Heritage Lead Focal Point. Then I have Miss Victoria Bockham who is ICH researcher and owner of Riches of the Earth. Yes. The Riches of the Earth, interesting. And then Mr. Patrick Howell, who is research and documentation in the Nevis Cultural Development Foundation and the St. Kitts and Nevis Intangible Cultural Heritage Second Focal Point, which is located in Nevis. To all three of you, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, so Thanks for having us here. Right, I will begin with Marlene. Marlene, St. Kitts and Nevis has embarked on this project to safeguard our intangible cultural heritage, treasures. So the first thing I'm going to ask you, of course, if you can give us some definitions. Those things always help. One, what is the definition of culture? Two, what is intangible culture? And three, if you have intangible culture, of course you must have tangible culture. So I want you to define those very three things so that people can understand. Okay. Well, culture is something that is embraced by a people and it manifests in many different ways. Sometimes it manifests through um, our traditions, our cultural traditions, through food, through dance, through speech, um, th through visually, the way that we dress, the way that we look, our environment, how we as a people live in a particular environment based on climate and geographical location. And um, in terms of intangible culture, when you're looking at that, again, it's, it's the way uh, a people live. Okay, it's the, I don't want to, well, I could say habit, but it's not habit, it's with intention. You know, um, it's, there's particular things that this, these people will do that become traditions. Um, they become the norms of their day-to-day -day living. Um, you know, whether it's uh, going to the farm, uh, planting the farm, harvesting the food from that, that could be something that's traditional to a particular people within a society. Um, everybody has their area of expertise where they have their skills and their strengths. And then, um, you know, when you're living in this society, all those intangible things become, a, some of them become traditional traditions and because and, they're norms that are accepted by the group of society. Um, for example, intangible culture here in St. Kitts is manifest through the performing arts, something that that is um, very dominant um, with uh, conditions and divisions. You see it played out in terms of dance, in terms of the music that is played from, um, you know, soca to uh, um, uh, string band music, which is more traditional music. Things like dance hall have been, you know, in influence from other neighboring islands have injected a unique kind of dance hall that's performed here or soca and things like that um, in terms of the food and the liberty um, in terms of some of the crafts that are made the intangible part is the process in what in which something is made or done um, when you're making a, a traditional dish there's certain ingredients that you would use and there's also a, a particular method in the preparation and that's the intangible part um, in terms of tangible, we're all very familiar um, with uh, heritage sites, built heritage, things you can touch, buildings, artifacts, um, you know, uh, different systems that you can actually go to a location and you can see something that's built, whether it be a building, a statue. Um, St. Kitts and Nevis is well known 
for its World Heritage Site, Brimson Hill, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and that's built heritage. But then also with, um, with Brimson Hill, there's an intangible culture that ex is expressed in the stories that are told about the people who occupied the fortress, the people that lived there and, and provided support services to the military that occupied it, you know, um, during 17th, 18th century. So they each have their, their place, and I don't think you can separate intangible culture from the tangible culture. There's always a story behind a heritage site about the people that occupied it. So, um, you know, you just have to look at which form it comes in. It could be in performing, it could be in traditional craft, it could be um, in uh, uh, oral tradition, it could be in um, natural environment and the universe and herbs and things like that. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the intangible culture is what gives rise to the tangible culture because you said that the intangible culture is what we do not see. The tangible culture is what we can see, what we can smell, what we can touch, and so on. But the intangible culture has to do with our beliefs, our values, the stories that we share from one generation to the next, our a recipe, for example, of how we make certain foods, um, our ideas that we have, our philosophy of life, our beliefs in God and and, and, and beliefs in other, in other things. These are the things that really inform the tangible culture, that which we can see and so on. So there's a story behind everything. Yes. There's a belief behind everything. The values that we hold as, as, as a society, the mm -hmm. sayings that we basically have, you know, in terms of how to live um, and so on, those things are extremely important. And you've said we can't separate them. Yeah. They go hand in hand. They with go each other. they go hand in hand because I'm sure that all of us can if we if we look inward into who we associate with, into our immediate family. What are what are the kinds of things that make us feel warm and, and fuzzy and have fond memories? It's experiences that we've had with our family members. Yes. You know, our close families, our friends, our extended family. And these relationships that we have with each other we bond by doing activities together. Sometimes, um, you know, your first bonding is with your parents. You know, they, um, your, your mother gives birth and brings you into the world, and she will nurture you and feed you and teach you right from wrong. And the yes. father will, will also help with that and teach what's right from wrong and how to grow up to be an upstanding woman or man in society. So what are the things that our parents have passed on to us? That's our first experience with tradition. And then, um, you know, you grow up, you become, you go to school, you're exposed to other people, teenage life, school, society, education. That gives you an impression, that causes you to form some decisions, make some decisions of your own about how you interact with people, about society. And those two things form who you are with your own experiences. So the traditional things, and when I say food, Everyone can think to that particular dish that your mom made or your father made for you growing up. And there's a particular way that she mixed the ingredients. And when you get older and have your own children, hopefully you will pass that on to your children, those techniques, those methods, those tradition. And then through generations, it carries on and it carries on. And this is, what, this is the fabric of intangible culture. Um, somebody that has a skill with making, uh, in terms of traditional craft, and they know how to make um, a quattro, a fife, um, a guitar. They have those skills of how to build it. Um, I can't build it, but I'm going to go to that person, and we call them tradition bearers, I'm going to go to the tradition bearer and ask him to make me a guitar, a quattro, or a fife, because he has the knowledge, he has the experience, the skill, and he knows the method in which to make it. That's the intangible part. So. So with intangible cultural heritage, to safeguard it, it must be transferred. Right. And so You must transfer so that knowledge to somebody else so that if something happens to the tradition bearer, the tradition still survives. Right. So we are talking here in terms of safeguarding 
safeguarding the treasures that we have, the intangible culture that we have. And so therefore we can talk about cultural reproduction. Over time, we can also speak about cultural retention and we can speak about um, cultural erasure because mm -hmm. you know if that culture is not reproduced, that you were yes. saying, and if it's not retained, then of course somehow it is re erased yes. over the years. And, and the erasure of culture is really a big part of us we lose mm -hmm. when our culture is lost. Yeah. And so therefore the safeguarding. Mr. Howell, I want you to tell me, what, what is your understanding of safeguarding the, the, the intangible cultural heritage that we have? And why is it so important for us to safeguard this I ICH, intangible cultural heritage, and what do we stand to benefit from safeguarding it? And what is being done actually at this present time? What is being put in place in order to safeguard it? Well, first, thanks for having me this morning, having us. Uh, as far as safeguarding, we have certain elements, um, at least on the, the Neva side, and you have it on the Senka side too, the giant, especially the giant despair. Using giant despair as an example, it's, it's very complex where you have to learn a lot of um, Bible verses. The, the, the script is very intense. And what we find on the Neva side, the, the, the young kids, uh, the younger generations now, they don't want to take the time to learn. I mean, they, do the da they would rather do the dance. They don't mind doing the music and the dance. But as far as learning the script, there's almost like they don't, they don't want to do it. There's no incentive. So we find that part of that, the giant experience specifically dying off in Nevis. Then you have the, you know, of course you have the elders. The elders want to, they, they want to see this, this part, this is things that they grew up with. They want to see it and they notice it's disappearing. So it's, it, you know, it's kind of heartbreaking on that part. Um, so safeguarding, you, I think that what was your, your last question was... Um, yeah, yeah, why was it so important, why is it important to safeguard? What is being put in place to safeguard the ICH? Well, that's why we're here. The, yes. um, the intangible cultural heritage, you know, that's, you know, that's what this whole thing is about us. Um, going out into the communities, finding out, you know, um, interacting with the community to find out What's in, what are we in danger of losing right now? Identifying these different elements mm -hmm. and going out as a, us as a team to record these things. If, if, and if it's um, viable, try to revive them and bring them back. Right. So, so there are a number of stages mm -hmm. that basically um, are involved yes. in the safeguarding. And, and you mentioned a few of them. One of them, of course, is that there must be some identification. Yes. Right. So Marlene, can you highlight the stages um, in terms of the IC, ICH? Yes. Well, um, we embarked on this project two years ago. And um, the first thing that we did was we had to sensitize the public. What is ICH? What is intangible cultural heritage? What does it look like? What does it mean? How do we recognize it in our environment, in society? And then we said, OK, well, we need to train people with some skill sets because in order to go out and do the research, the pilot research study was one aspect of the project, but we had to um, prepare some skills to send people out into the, into the community. So we taught people how to use a video camera, how to use an audio recorder, how to put together um, interview questions, how to do the research. Um, we had seven research teams in St. Kitts and three in Nevis, and they were given um, particular zones, because you know St. Kitts is quite large, so they were given a specific zone, and in that zone to go out into the community and speak to the community and find out, you know, what's going on, what, what is the community, um, you know, what do they value, what do they want help preserving. And so uh, we ended up in St. Kitts discovering about 14 different elements, and in Nevis 3, as a part of the project, and the teams went out um, it, it included um, an interviewer, a documentalist, and a coordinator. And they went out, conducted the interviews, and brought back um, photographs, video, audio. So at least we have it documented. And 
Unfortunately, or fortunately, one of the um, elements that the, the tradition bearers that was interviewed passed away shortly after we had done an interview with them. And this is exactly what we're speaking about. If we had not um, been blessed to be able to meet this individual and to interview them and document them about, about their skills, um, we're not sure if that, a record of that would be around. Now maybe the next generation, maybe somebody in his family wants to carry on that tradition, or at the very least we have that information and somebody might want to recreate it. So we have it from the source, we have it from that, that, that person in particular. So the process is very, very important to be trained um, with the skills and also to be sensitive. When you're, asking, when you're doing an interview, you have to do your research and you have to know, um, you know what kinds of questions are not too invasive. You, know, you mm -hmm. don't want to ask the wrong questions, you want them to be very relevant, and you want the tradition bearer to feel comfortable so we usually do it on their, in their territory at their place where they live or a place that's comfortable to them. So it's been a, a very, um, it's been a long process, like doing the training first because we're all excited and wanted to just jump in and start doing it. And the pilot lasted um, about a month. A month the teams went out, did their research, and now we're processing that information and we're about to present it at, at a seminar that we're hosting at Shadwell Great House on the 24th of February um, to showcase what we found and share that with the public. And also we have plans of creating a website. Again, all this information will be uploaded to the website and it will become a resource for the public and also for teachers and principals and people in the education system and students to be able to go on and learn about these elements and, and keep up to date on what we're doing as an institution to help safeguard these valuable treasures. Right, so you've identified several things in terms of the safeguarding. Mm -hmm. The first is identification. Yes. And then of course you have documentation because mm -hmm. you have to document the research that has to go into it. Then the preservation, very important. The protection, promotion, mm -hmm. um, enhancement, and of course the transmission. Yes, you know, the transmission that, that, that of the is, knowledge is, right, is that, that critical. That is where the yes. education comes in, yes. whether it be formal or informal, and the revitalization of certain aspects of the, mm -hmm. of the heritage, mm -hmm. basically. Absolutely, and, and where, where we help as institutions, and Nevis Cultural Development Foundation, St. Kitts Department of Culture, um, and also even our historical societies, Nevis Historical and Conservation Society and St. Christopher National Trust, National Archives, all of these institutions play um, a very important supportive role to the community. Because um, you have to understand with ICH, the people are the ones that choose to do those skills and, or have those skills and do those things and keep them alive. Um, if they decide to stop, that's totally up to them. But then what a loss that would be to, to society because it's such a, a, um, a it is a treasure. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, we love to see um, our folklore performers performing. You know, it warms our heart, it entertains us, you know, um, brings back good memories. Children love it. You know, there's history behind it. Very educational when you look into the history of how these things formed and what they meant to our enslaved Africans that were a part of colonization. So there's deep meaning there. Um, the the local um, the environment and traditional crafts that are made from what's in our environment from the trees, you know, certain kinds of mm -hmm. bushes and herbs and things that we use medicinally. These are things that that um, the majority of society in Saint Kitts and Nevis partake of. In their, on an individual basis, drinking bush tea or drinking teas, local teas, um, eating the local food, local produce. So, so if we're unable to safeguard that, then where would, where would we be as a people? Right. We, you know, we would be, we'd be lost if we can't eat the food that we need to eat to nourish our bodies. We have to take care of it. We have to make sure that we're always planting, that, we're always, that, we're always, um, that we preserve the, the tree that's used to make the stilts for the makajumbi. Mm -hmm. We have to preserve the bushes, the herbs that we use medicinally to help us get better. Mm -hmm. So this is what it's about, transferring the knowledge, making sure that, um, you know, we listen to the community. They've got to tell us what is dear to them. And then we, 
we'll work with them with our expertise and our knowledge about you know um, what support can be given we educate them and we try and build programs to transfer the knowledge train if that manifests in terms of training workshops well then we'll look at that and see how we can source funds to have a workshop go on that will transfer knowledge to the next generation you know those are the kinds of support things that we want to do and are able to do um, to to help the community feel you know secure yeah I know that uh, UNESCO the United Nations body um, United Nations educational scientific and cultural, cultural organization, organization yes has a, a role especially around the world in, 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 in advocating mm -hmm. for the preservation of culture mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. First, uh, and so yes. on and of course uh, what, 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 what involvement does UNESCO have with this project that you have undertaken? Um, well, uh, well UNESCO um, has an intangible cultural heritage fund and is directly the result of the 2003 UNESCO Convention on ICH. And when the, a state party becomes signatory to that convention, you know, there's certain obligations that the country has in terms of contributing to the fund, but also it opens up an opportunity for you to submit projects and proposals and have it funded by this, this ICH fund. And we were blessed um, to have our proposal accepted, our two years proposal, and we were we meaning St. Kitts and Nevis was awarded in excess of 99,000 US dollars. So um, we were very pleased. Um, our four phase project, we're near the end now, where we've done the training, we've done the research, and we have, we're ready to show the results of our hard work. Mm -hmm. And we've also been able to establish ICH secretariats, both in St. Kitts and Nevis, which, where the work will continue when the project closes um, on the 1st of April, 2021. So we're pleased that, um, uh, to me, the project has worked out very well. Um, even despite of the pandemic, we've been able to go out into the communities and conduct the research safely. And we, um, you know, we're so excited to share the results of, of, of what we've, of the work that we've done. And I, I'm very happy to know that the Secretariat will mean that the work will continue. You know, the, the Secretariat is housed in St. Kitts, at least, in Department of Culture. So you can contact us if you're in the community and there's some kind of ICH element that you think is, needs to be safeguarded in your community. And then we'll work from there. You know, we'll, we'll learn about it. We'll assess the situation, see what the community wants to do about it, and then help to formulate a plan going forward to safeguard. Mm -hmm. um, so we're very, very happy. Um, this is, this is a, a good result where the government has actually um, put money into the sec establishing the Secretariat because what happens with s most projects is you have the money, when the money ends with the project, everything stops. You know, there has to be sustainability um, and so that's why I'm really pleased with what has happened in, in our case. Right, now Victoria, you are a researcher of intangible cultural heritage. What do you have to share with us in terms of your research? what you have found. Okay. Well, I chose to target were the Christmas sports, which is also known as folklore. And in particular, there are t uh, three elements that are in danger of disappearing. The uh, David and Goliath, the giant despair, and the mummies. Now, right now, everyone is focused on the masquerades. Everyone loves the masquerades. And it seemed like the mummies have morphed into the masquerades. But they were different, completely different. Now, first of all, the reason they were called Christmas sports was because of the physical fighting involved in these sports, right? And they were also uh, held during Christmas. So I decided that we needed to find more information about these uh, particular ones that I have identified. Now the problem was that the information for the giant despair is virtually distinct, almost gone. Um, 
but we do have a tradition bearer, 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 or bearer, <laughs> who is very knowledgeable about uh, the giant despair, although he did not have a lot of the uh, dialogue, so he did have to improvise. Uh, with the David and Goliath, that also has become distinct. In fact, one of the books that I did find information called The Christmas Sports in St. Kitts says that the last performance was in Sandy Point in 1965. So we wanted to make sure that we were able to preserve these particular um, folklore or Christmas sports. Now, with the difference is the music. For example, in the David and Goliath, the big drum was used. In the um, mummies, they had the fife and the kettle drum. Uh, the same with the um, de uh, giant despair. Now, what was interesting about these particular performances is that this was a battle between good and evil. Now, it appeared that the locals at the time uh, always were telling stories, but they didn't want the planters to know what they were saying or what it was really about. So they were very uh, astute in how they conveyed their information to the locals. And it was always about how they were able to overcome all of the difficulties that they had to endure uh, under, you know, the system that they had to deal with. So they used a number of different ways to be able to tell the story. But what is really interesting is that they took all year to prepare for these Christmas sports because they had to make all their instruments, they had to do all their costumes, they had to do everything. Uh, and it took a long time for them to do that. But when they were able to actually perform it, I understand, because I wasn't here at the time, but it was very exciting for the people to see the Christmas sports come around and tell their stories. And it was very physical. For example, with the mummies, um, oh no, the giant despair, all of them had a giant. And the giant was always defeated in the end. But they were very physical. Uh, and the children would be very excited, but they had to run away from the giant because they were physical. The people who portrayed the giant or who portrayed these characters in the uh, Christmas sports. Um, well, for example, uh, in David and Goliath, they always chose a young boy to choose um, uh, to play David, as you know we know in the Bible. Uh, yet David was able to kill the giant, once again proving that good prevails over evil. So at this time, it appeared that the people were more uh, into church and religion also, because they were very disciplined. And the children were, uh, they had to, go to, had to go to church at that particular time. So this is why they were interested in these kind of uh, plays. Now, unfortunately, when it comes to who really were the authors of these plays, that's where a little confusion comes in. Because through my research, I find that a lot of this came from Africa. However, when you read the information that's available, you see that it's always attributed to Europeans. Uh, for example, with the mummies, they were um, depicting the Knights Templar. 
and their role was to guard the uh, pilgrims. However, when you read the names of some of these knights, you see that you have the king of Egypt, and you have the, the black prince of Palestine. So you get a little more information that this mm -hmm. is before the pilgrims, that this information was really something that was brought here from Africa. Now, what I find is that the link is still missing between St. Kitts and Nevis and Africa. And this is something that we are now able to um, show more information for our young people to know that where we came from, which I believe is very important. And that's why I wanted these particular plays to be uh, preserved because it tells the story of what we had to endure and how we were able to overcome despite all the hardships that we had to endure. So another thing aspect of this though is I look at this for our youth that this is something that they could also use to build skills because a lot of them no longer know how to make the costumes. They don't know how to use, to make the instruments. As Marlene was saying, one of the men who was uh, made the fifes, he's dead now. So we need to be, our children need to learn more about their culture and how to make the things that we need to preserve the, uh, the sports or the folklore. You know, right now, we we, there's a shortage of how to make the hunter whip. We now looking for people. We have one person who may know how to do it, but that's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. How is it that we're saying we are about preserving our culture, but we don't know how to do it? We don't know how to to do what's necessary to keep it in force. Yes. So I think that this is an important area that this intangible cultural uh, heritage affords our youth, that this is an opportunity for them to learn some additional skills mm -hmm. that they can now also take into uh, a, a broader uh, environment, you know. If you can learn how to make a costume, then you can become a tailor. If you can make a, a, a instrument, then, you know, you can make music. There are so many things that we can do with this. <coughs> and we need to bring our youth and get them more involved. But first, they have to know the importance of it. And this is where it comes with the culture, where we come from. Why is this important to know this, you know? And then once we embrace that and they learn this, then they will be more willing to learn how to do these other things that's necessary to keep this going. You know, it, it is so important what you said, especially with starting with our young people, because they have to be the ones to transmit the culture, to carry it forward. And it is so important that they understand what you said in terms of their culture and how much that that contributes to their identity. It's an identity issue. And I think that we <clears throat> live in the society now where there is an identity crisis because we don't really understand sometimes where we have come from. And you mentioned the links and so on. But it becomes more difficult especially today. We don't have a monoculture. We live in a very multicultural society, a pluralistic society. And so therefore you have 
transculturalism taking place. You see now even sometimes our foods and so on. What is it that people want? People want KFC. But KFC is not our culture. Pizza Hut is not our culture. <laughs> Certain ways in terms of dressing that we see on television and so on with the sagas, people sagging and all that sort of a thing. That is not our culture. So the question becomes even more important. What is our culture? What is unique to us? And I think that many people are lost in culture in terms of, you know, what can we basically say is our culture for a fact? Mm -hmm. um, you're absolutely right. We live in a very multicultural world, very multicultural country um, because of technology and transportation and travel. Um, you can go anywhere in the world virtually so you can learn about other cultures. And a lot of people, we, we travel to different countries and experience different cultures. Why is it important not to lose our culture? Um, a, self, uh, a sense of um, self-worth, you know? Um, there's nothing wrong with appreciating somebody else's culture. However, you have to know your foundation. You have to know what you stand for. And, what, and when you know what you stand for, which is the things that make up your culture and your identity, then you can defend it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, to me, losing your culture is like having amnesia. You know, you don't recognize the people around you. If you think about it, if you lose your culture, then you, and you're picking up everybody else's culture, at some point you must get confused. You're disconnected from who you really you're are. Yeah, you're disconnected from, from your foundation. You know, um, it's very, very important to give us that sense of identity, to have us feel secure, to know where you're coming from and what, you're, what you stand for, what your country, your nation stands for, and why. You know, um, I think the gap is not being filled because it has to do with education. We have to look at the content of what textbooks are being used mm. to teach our children. Where do the textbooks come from? What kind of information is coming from those textbooks? Are we learning about other people's histories? And why? Mm -hmm. Why are we not learning about Caribbean history? What's happened Caribbean in the Latin America? This is where we say we are. Should we not know this first and foremost? And coming even close, smaller, should you not know your nation first? Should you not know the history and heritage and culture of St. Kitts and Nevis first and be um, you know, an A++ student in that information? And why should we have our story told to the eyes of others. Absolutely. Why, Absolutely Why can't not. we tell our own <laughs> yeah, right. story? Why the Europeans came and they, for a long time, our story was really told by them. Yes, yes. And because our story was told by them, <laughs> they told that story through their own beliefs mm -hmm and their own values, and, and, and their own ideas, and through their own lenses. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, 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 and so therefore, there has to be some sort of a reshaping of our culture told through us. Yes. yes. You know, for example, you had the, um, they came and they said, oh, the Caribs and the Arawaks, which were European names, really. Mm -hmm. But those were not the indigenous names. No, we Kalinago. Were the Kalinagos yes. and the, the Tainos Taino, yes. and so on. Yes. You know, so we have a lot to do in terms of, you know, really finding what basically is ours and preserving it. Yes. And I suppose that is what you are on a mission to do. Yes, um, we are trying to do our little bit. Um, but we need, we need to empower members of the community. Um, this is a fantastic opportunity for young people. I, I say young people, I'm not discrediting our elders, but I'm, I'm trying to um, target intentionally our young people. They're young. 
They've got lots of energy. They're creative. We're living in a digital age. They tell us how to do things on the computer, on the phone. They tell us about technology. So who, who, who is better to, to take this on than the young people? I want to encourage the writers out there, our young writers, to write about your local experience. What are you experiencing? There are some people, um, you know, you go through school and they have affinity for poetry, putting words together. Um, write about, write a, write a book, I don't want to say a history book, but write about your experience, the knowledge you have. You know, do your research properly, get your facts straight, but publish a book, publish something. Maybe this textbook can be incorporated into the curriculum and used by teachers to teach about St. Kitts and Nevis, you understand? If writing is not your, ex your area of expertise, but you have an excellent eye in, in seeing things and capturing things with photography, with videography, you can tell a story using those mediums. Mm -hmm. If you're an expressive person and you have affinity for um, performing arts and you're into uh, drama, or you're into dance. I want our young people to start thinking about the kinds of presentations and performances you're going to be doing. Try and make the content about your people, about your history, about you know St. Kitts and Nevis experiences, about a heritage site, a landmark. These things can be used as educational tools for younger people and for adults as well. You know, so I want to encourage the young people start a profession. Mm -hmm. Take your hobby of writing or photography or videography and turn it into something, make some educational content that can be used. And also um, purchase things that are, are local in terms of content. Um, I know that I want to read stories about other people that look like me. <laughs> I think that when you're raising your children, you need to um, show them pictures of of people that look like them, in addition to the other people that populate the world. This is how you, how you educate someone. You don't just feed them one perspective or one type of information. So with the intangible cultural heritage, as I said before, it's expressed in these different types of areas. Oral tradition is one way it's expressed. Performing arts is expressed as another way. Traditional craft is another way. Natural herbs is another way. And when you look at each of those different sections, I'm sure you can come up with, um, you can identify ICH in each of those areas. So I think it's just for young people to identify what, you know, what, what turns you on? What's your passion? What do you enjoy doing? And then give something back to your community. Yeah, you, while you spoke about the oral tradition, the oral tradition will only be preserved if it is documented. In, um, in this day and age, yes, yes, with technology, because no longer, everything is moving so fast, no longer do we make time to sit around the tree or sit on the step with our mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, grandparents, to give them an opportunity to, to orally sh tell us the story. You know, we don't have time. Oh, that's boring. I don't want to go see Granny. That's how it's being lost. So yes, it's very true. If we're not doing those things and connecting with our family members and our aunts, uncles, and cousins because we're too, it's too fast, we've got to document it so it's preserved and it's there for when you're ready. That's yeah. why you take photographs you know, of your family members, of your children, of your babies, and things like that. So you have something to go back to look to as a fond memory. Yeah. So and we and do have to do that still. And we understand too yes. that, that culture is not something that is static. Culture is dynamic, so it evolves, and culture yes. changes over time. And we must be able to, as well, recognize that and yes. sometimes document the changes as well in the culture. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. The, the documentation that we're doing, and we're, doing, we're going to the tradition bearers because they're our elders, and they learn what they're doing from another elder, like, and they've been doing it for decades. So they are the truest form that we have to understand that method or that technique. So we document it. But as you said, culture is evolving and dynamic and is always changing. So when we have that, that um, true representation of how it was, and we document it again five years later, and we can, we can actually identify the transition or the change, you know, with, um, 
for example, with the mas uh, the masquerade, and they wear a wire uh, face mask yes. that actually mimics the colonial oppressors. Right. Had a white face, blue eyes, you know, rosy cheeks. I've actually witnessed Bart Simpson on a mask. So that's an example <laughs> of, you know, culture evolving. You know, obviously a young person who has grown up is familiar with the, the comic Bart Simpson, put it on his mask. But, you know, that, that shows a change. But at least we can say, okay, well, back in this, you know, in the 1800s, it act, this is what the mask used to look like, and it represented this. So we can mark the change, and we can actually discuss and have a conversation of, about why. And to me, that demonstrates that the tradition is being lost. Yes. So, I just want to say uh, one thing. You were talking about Kentucky Fried Chicken. I think that we need to also think about the way foods used to be made here, and that Children, our youth need to learn more about that. You know, uh, the cassava flour, how the jams are made, cassava how the bread. drinks, the cassava bread, because it's lost. You have only a few people now doing those things, right? But the majority of our youth, they are not learning these things. No, they don't want cornmeal porridge. They want <laughs> cornflakes. They want Cheerios. But why is so that? On. Why is that? Hmm? Why is that? That's what they were raised on now. Yeah, well, now you have more choices. Well, yes, but I know that they would be more interested if, the, if they were given the opportunity. You know, when I look at my husband make all of these different things, right, from the fruits that we grow, from the uh, vegetables that we grow, we don't have to go to the store to buy anything, maybe the sugar, and even now, we're learning how to make other products without using so much sugar. But I think that our youth need to be taught that this was a part of their history. Yes, and another thing to probably what we are not good at documenting is those recipes. Because that's a part of our intangible culture. So the documentation of the recipes, how to do certain things, and, and maybe that's part of what we are losing why people are not preparing the kind of dishes and so on because that that basically speaks to our culinary arts mm -hmm. our culinary skills mm -hmm. which is a part of the intangible culture yeah and and um, in terms of the recipes they are handed down orally you know you mm -hmm. have to go in the kitchen with granny to see how she makes it because she hasn't written she hasn't written it down she's going to give you a book Here's the recipe, child. No, come in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You take the bowl. I'm going to tell you what to do. You crack the eggs. You mix it so. Add some pinch of salt. That, so yes. it's an oral transfer. It's an oral transfer, but yes. that is probably why sometimes some of it gets lost because we don't write yes. it down. Yes. But if we are more in terms of, we are not very good at documentation, and I know that that is your area. Yes. If we do not document, we lose yes. things. So you, so you understand that because we're living in this kind of a technology age, it's very e qu quick and easy for a young person to document because everybody has a phone. You, you don't need um, expensive equipment to document something. Use your cell phone. Um, but, but that, when you, you asked at the, the top of our discussion, what is culture? That is a culture um, of, of, of um, interacting together. And the transmission of it is oral and it's by demonstration and our ancestors our african ancestors passed on tradition orally and this is a part of who we are so i i, I want us to embrace that you know we, we were very talkative people and we do um, pass on information orally and that's good i just don't want that to die i don't mind if we don't write down the recipe but you have institutional memory and in your own families you and in your own communities you must be able to save that information and transfer it to somebody else family member school children you know and that's why we're special that's what mm -hmm. makes us unique is that um, for example if you go to um, certain tribes in Africa and you're a visitor or a foreigner and you go and visit their location they're not going to reveal all of their secrets. It's not for you to know. It's for the members of that community to 
preserve and maintain those traditionals, uh, tradition, uh, traditions for themselves and for the next generation. They will share with you what they choose to share with you. So we have to also understand that the trademarks that uh, yeah copyright intellectual property that the tradition bearer has every right to be the first earner of that valuable information mm -hmm. if they are so inclined. Mm -hmm. They have the knowledge and they want to do it as a business. They're absolutely fine. They don't have to share every single thing with us because they're going to turn it into a business for themselves. There's Just like KFC has not shared its recipe ah, with anybody. Right. That's, right. that's, you know, that's a secret. Right. It is. It's their recipe. Right. Yeah. But there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that. We tr Looking traditional, we have um, local drinks, local juices. We've got sour sap juice. We have tamarind drinks. We've got mabi. We've got cassava and things of that nature that people make here and make very well and sell it. And they should. The thing with traditional knowledge is we want the tradition bearer to earn and to benefit from it. Yes. Some people don't want to be the oh. You know, I, I just want to pass it down to my family members, and that's fine. Or somebody might not know how to turn it into a business, but have the interest to do that. We can advise them. We can guide them. We can show them examples, you know. So um, being, being re rewarded monetarily for that information, that knowledge yes. is important, too, which in the project we have been... Um, offering, you know, modest stipends to people who we have interviewed to say thank you for taking the time to share the information with us. Mm -hmm. We are not going to benefit from it other than sharing it, you know, documenting it and sharing it for educational purposes. But by all means, they, can, they, sh they should benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ms. Mr. Howell, um, you have in Nevis the Nevis Historical Conservation Society. Yes. And you also have the Nevis Cultural Development Foundation. Foundation. How active are they in terms of the culture and the preservation of the, the culture? Creating, for example, a knowledge base, making people aware, and so on. One of the things we have unique with the Historical Conservation Society is that because they're locked into a lot of the expats, we're finding out we're getting some of us, some of the story that we didn't know we had. It's out there. Like for instance, um, yesterday, for example, I was privy to some material from 1962 where uh, a gentleman named Alan Lomax came to the Federation and he did recordings in both Sinkets and Nevis. And these recordings ended up in the Library of Congress, and we didn't know that we had these sto uh, our stories sitting in the U.S. Mm -hmm. just like. Some of the African nations now are real, uh, starting to demand their artifacts back from England, mm -hmm. the, you know, our stolen stories. So we have our stories too, but the, the question is, where are our stories? Like, I also got some material from a, another expat that shows when the visions used to jump on boats and go to the Great Salt Pan and harvest salt because, and the, and the big part about that was because there was no refrigeration. Right. You needed that salt to go back and cure your pork and you, to keep your meat. So. Our stories, our stories are out there, so we, but the point is where. And there was a special word for it. You say you're, you're going to have your corn pork, pork yes. your corn meat, but basically it was the salt that was put in it f to preserve it, yes. especially when there were no um, many refrigerators around mm -hmm. and, and so on. I, I looked at my, my grandmother, who has since passed, but she always, even, even when she had a fridge, she was still corn in her meat, mm -hmm. corn in her pork, and, and things like that. Perhaps it was not very good because of all the salt, and our knowledge now of salt, and it's linked to hypertension, yes. and all of that. But <laughs> I think this is kind of interesting that you're saying that expats mm -hmm. are bringing the information to us. Or they've had it. Or they had it. How, it. Why, how, did, how come they have the information why we don't have the information? Short answer is we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they came down, harvested, went back to their respective countries, and, you know, like I said, the recordings I listened to, it's in the Library of Congress. Mm. In America. In, in America. Mm. And, and luckily for us, because the, um, you know, the copyrights, I guess, have run out, we, we now have access to it. So I'll be making that available to you guys now. Right. So. Excellent. <laughs> 
And th that's a very um, great example of why we need to value our own culture. Mm -hmm. When we recognize how important we are and how important our traditions are, um, you know, other people find us fascinating. Yes. They find our culture fascinating. They're drawn to it. They're drawn to our music, our foods, our personality. And that's why they come and they visit. They come and visit the country to learn about these things. Um, but we also have to educate ourselves to protect our tra cultural traditions so that they're not stolen like that, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so that your your it's not it doesn't mean to keep it a secret. However, um, make sure you tell someone in your fam pass on that knowledge to a member, a family member, a child, uh, so the tradition can live on within your family. If you don't, if you choose not to take it, share it with the public, yes. and you want to benefit from it, because that is what has been happening for centuries. We have had um, you know Europeans. Um, North American, people on the North American continent, um, other countries coming to Africa, to the Caribbean, Asia. and taking what is valuable to us. And I think it's just because we don't value it. We, we, we take it for granted how we live, and we're living very good and very clean, beautiful country, beautiful, um, fertile soil and, and land. And um, yeah, so it, it's very important for us to value our own cultural traditions. I don't know why it's so hard for us to embrace that and to recognize that the food that we eat, the way that we talk, the way that we wear our hair, the, you know, we're fashionable. We need a little bit, well, let's say a lot more modesty in how we dress yes. because those things to me have been influences from the outside. Yes. Mm -hmm. we, we need to um, get back to dressing modestly and, and being proud of ourselves and not having to, sh to reveal, to demonstrate how, how, how amazing we are, how intelligent we are. Yeah. But we need to value um, what we have here already and protect it and make sure it remains in the country, in St. Kitts and Nevis, and that we're able to benefit from that. And this project that we're doing Identifying the ICH elements is the, the, the beginning of that journey. Not the beginning of our preservation because Department of Culture has been around um, since 1995. So for the past 26 years, we have been doing it. You know, Nevis has a Department of Culture as well. They've got a foundation yes. and we are continuing to do that. But with the 2003 convention, um, we've been given access to terminology that expresses what we've been doing safeguarding, ICH, tradition bearers, preservation, you know, um, um, it's just been giving, given those terms. So the next step uh, after identifying these elements and the work will continue to identify more, um, we want to um, recommend for it to be on the international list, UNESCO's international list of intangible mm -hmm. cultural heritage, representative list. Why? So that Everyone in the country knows the elements that are valuable to St. Kitts and Nevis, and the world knows. Can you mention and then, them? Can you name them? Sure. And then we go forward, and we can safeguard them to stop them from diminishing. Mm -hmm. Some of the elements that we discovered through this process was storytelling. Storytelling, um, cassava bread, bread making, parched nuts, um, Nevis pottery, Nevis, uh, um, in Nevis, um, vernacular houses, and also, um, what was the other herb? Cactus. Cactus. Um, yeah. We've looked at broom making here. We've also looked at, as Victoria mentioned, the art form performing arts, David and Goliath, mummies, giant and despair. Um, and those are some of the elements that were the results of this research. And so the seminar on the 24th at Shadwell, we'll be giving a visual of it. We'll have mm -hmm. some, some tables set up. So some of the tradition bearers will be with us in that venue from 1130 until three o'clock. So we invite the public to come pass through Shadwell during the afternoon and come and see the display, the showcase that we have. Um, 
showing these elements through video, photographs, and also um, visual displays. And all your COVID-19 safety measures yes, will be in place. The, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we're very pleased of the work that's been done. And again, that it's, it's going to be sustained and going forward, we'll be able to continue doing the research that's required. And um, we just want people to um, really take a look at what's happening in their own lives, what is important, and make an effort to preserve that in your family at least. Teach mm -hmm. your children right. about how you grew up, how your aunts and uncles grew up, and value where you have arrived today, you know, because we build upon our traditions. And right. that gives a strength and a sense of, um, I hope it gives people a strength, a, a sense of belonging, um, feeling like you, um, you know, uh, that you are entitled to benefit from what your country has to offer mm. in the natural environment and in the intangible sense. And, and you really are blessed if you have a mother and a father who, and, or grandparents um, who are around that spend time with you because they're not going to be here forever. True. And now is the time for you to, you know, talk to them, get to know them a little bit better and, and um, preserve those memories that are traditions in your family. Right. We really are out of time. I would like Victoria and uh, Mr. Howell, of course, to give us some parting words. Well, thank you for having us, first of all. And this has been, for me, coming from America, this has been a very uh, rewarding experience because most of our culture was robbed of us in America as black Americans. And so coming here and at least seeing some of the things, how you know, used to do things, it's been very rewarding for me. Uh, and I hope that we will be able to have more of an impact on our youth, which is of most concern to me. And I uh, really am so appreciative for having this opportunity to live in St. Kitts and Nevis and to learn more about my own culture because learning that I come from Africa, you know, these are things mm -hmm. We were just taught we were slaves in America. And so now I am learning more about who I am and who our people are. And this is very rewarding to me. And thank you for this opportunity. Mr. Howell. Thanks for the opportunity again. I'd also like to add this project is for us, by us and for us. If you know, for instance, you're in your house, your grandmother might have some old VHS tapes or any old material, by all means, bring it forward. They might have stories, our stories on it for us to bring forward to the general public. I'm not a big public speaker, so <laughs> like I said, um, the seminar coming up on the 24th at Shadwell, you know, we implore the public to come out and be a part of it because we can't survive without you guys. It's a two-way street, and it's us for you guys. Right, so I want to thank all three of you. Marlene Phillips, who is the research and documentation specialist at the Department of Culture in St. Kitts, and of course the St. Kitts and Nevis focal point for the intangible cultural heritage. Victoria, ICH researcher and the owner of Riches of the Earth. I understand that you have a very fruitful farm. Yes. <laughs> oh, and they grow a lot of stuff and, and, and that, that is yes. all a part of the culture as well, you know, using the fruits of the earth yes. and, uh, and so on to really to use that, what we have. Because, you know, in America, I learned everything. I, we went to the store for everything. So now being able to go to the a tree to my, get my fruits, it's a, you know, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, you know, once again, I just feel like, 
I'm blessed. Yeah, thank you. And, and Mr. Patrick Howell said he's not much of a public speaker, but he is the research and documentation um, specialist in Nevis at the Cultural Nevis Cultural Development Foundation and the focal point for the intangible cultural heritage in Nevis. Thank you to all three of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.